Within four decades of their arrival in Italy, the Norse-descended Normans had sunk their claws into the peninsula, humbling many of the local rulers, including the Pope in Rome, whose alliance was defeated by them. Now, with their foothold secure in the heart of the Latin world, they turned their attention to the south. Welcome to part two of our series on the Normans in Italy, where they will fight against the Muslims in Sicily. Thanks to Call of War for sponsoring this video. Call of War is a free-to-play real-time cross-platform strategy game played by millions of users worldwide, with historically accurate army units that move in real-time on historical maps, a huge tech tree with over 120 different units, battles with up to 100 human players with a complex economy and trade. Everything is possible in Call of War. Play through all the different scenarios and outcomes of World War II. The game starts in a historically accurate World War II setting and allows you to rewrite history in any way. Choose your country, join the war and fight other players in real time. Tank rush your opponents, establish air superiority, flood enemy ground with battalions of infantry, bombard coastal cities with mighty naval fleets, or dominate with secret weapons such as nuclear bombers and V2 rockets. You can play with the same account on PC or mobile, and sign up for new special events with different maps, different scenarios and different objectives each week. Support our channel by downloading Call of War via the link in the description, and receive a free starter pack with 1 month of high command and 13,000 gold with a value of $10. Hurry, it's only available for 30 days for those who sign up through the link in the description. The Normans had not been idle since their victory over Pope Leo at Civitate. By the year 1060, they had stabilized their rule over northern Apulia, properly conquered Calabria, and seized a sizable chunk of Campania. The papacy was forced to abandon their plan to expel them from Italy, and instead render legitimacy to the Norman realm, recognizing it as the Duchy of Apulia and Calabria. Ruling this duchy was the redoubtable Robert de Orteville, known to friend and foe as Giscard, a title translating to the cunning. He and his brother Roger de Orteville were the head and backbone of Norman Italy, and in time would establish themselves as two of the greatest conquerors of the Middle Ages. Nominally a papal vassal, the Normans remained restless and free-spirited. Always on the lookout for more land and plunder, they would soon turn their attention towards the Strait of Messina and eye the fertile lemon fields across the narrow waters. By the mid-11th century, the Isle of Sicily had been under Muslim rule for over 150 years. It had been the Tunisian Aghlabid dynasty that had ousted the Byzantines in 830 AD, before later being subsumed by the Fatimid juggernaut. In 948, an independent emirate ruled by the Chalbids was established on the island. Sicily had flourished under Islamic purview. It was considered perhaps the wealthiest island in the Mediterranean, its climate sunny and warm, its fields rich and fertile. Its capital city, Palermo, was the second largest in all of Europe, with a massive population of 350,000 citizens. However, by 1060, not all was well on the idyllic isle. The last Chalbite emir had been assassinated in 1052, and with his death, the island fractured politically into three principalities, all feuding with one another for dominion over the whole realm. Present also was a sizable population of native Greek Christians, who sought greater autonomy and a co-religionist protector from across the sea. The Pope hoped that Giscard would conquer Sicily in the name of Christendom, and made Robert Giscard the Duke of Sicily despite him having no control over the island. Of course, Robert needed very little convincing from his spiritual suzerain to open up the new southern frontier and attempt to conquer the rich island. The opportunity to invade Sicily came when the ruler of Syracuse, Ibn Timna, who was deeply embroiled in a blood feud with his rival, the ruler of Agrigento, Ibn Hawas, approached Roger de Orteville in Calabria and asked for his aid. Ibn Timna had been thoroughly crushed in battle, 
and had finally become desperate enough to turn to the Normans for help in subduing his foe, a notion which by now everyone else in southern Italy would call a profoundly bad idea. Roger, the younger and more hot-blooded of the Orteville brothers, jumped at this opportunity. In the winter of 1061, 150 mounted Norman knights and a handful of auxiliaries crossed the strait and landed in the hinterlands northwest of Messina. They pillaged the rich and undefended countryside before handily crushing a Muslim army that had been raised against them. Roger and his knights attacked Messina but were driven from the city's fortified walls. They retreated to their ships, only to find that they had been scattered by a Muslim fleet. They bunkered on the stormy beach for three days, fending off raids from Messina, until on the fourth day their ships returned and they evacuated safely with their loot in tow. While their first foray into Sicily had been something of a misstep, the Normans now knew of the riches of the Southern Isle and resolved to return. In the spring of the next year, they levied another army to do just that, comprised of 2,000 infantry and 450 mounted knights, led this time by both Orteville brothers. Knowing they would need to outmaneuver the Muslim fleet to avoid meeting a watery grave before even touching Sicilian soil, they devised a plan. Robert mustered the lion's share of his men and ships at the Rock of Scylla to divert the attention of the Muslim fleet. Indeed, as the forces of Ibn Hawas gathered on the opposite end of the strait to oppose the Norman landing, Roger had sneakily made the crossing five miles south with some 500 men. They prowled the countryside undetected and struck Messina from the south. Roger was dumbfounded to find that Robert's diversion had worked better than they could have ever expected. The city had been left entirely unprotected. The Normans seized it with barely a fight, and the Muslim army outside the city, realizing they were caught in a pincer, fled westwards. The Greek Christian citizens of Messina greeted the Normans as liberators and offered the conquering knights a thanksgiving service. The Orteviles rested briefly before continuing their campaign. Soon their Muslim ally Ibn Timna attached his army to theirs, and together they marched deeper into the heart of the island. Much of eastern Sicily was loyal to Ibn Timna and did not resist the movement of his Norman allies. The town of Paterno fell quickly, and the Normans soon came upon the mountain fortress of Enna, the principal stronghold of Ibn Hawas. Knowing they could never penetrate the castle walls, the Normans set to pillaging the countryside to harass Ibn Hawas into open battle. This worked like a charm, and despite vastly outnumbering his foe, Hawas's light Arabic infantry proved no match for heavy Norman knights who crushed their opponents in the field. Despite this great victory, Robert knew that he was overextended and thus left the fortress untaken, consolidating his gains in northeastern Sicily while allowing most of his soldiers to return to their families in Apulia with loot in hand. Roger, on the other hand, rode into the predominantly Greek Christian town of Troina, which welcomed him as a liberator. Here he wintered, but then he learned that one Judith of Evro had arrived in Calabria. She was the daughter of a Franco-Norman noble and was Roger's betrothed, so he returned home to marry her. However, marital bliss would soon turn into domestic turmoil. Roger was incensed with his older brother's tendency to take the lion's share of land and loot won in their campaigns. The younger Orteville demanded titles and privileges and threatened to take them by force. Absolutely enraged by his little brother's insolence, Robert rode down to Roger's capital at Mileto and laid siege to it. Roger slipped out of his capital in disguise and into the nearby town of Giraci. He was pursued ardently by his older brother, but the townsfolk of Giraci, loyal to Roger, managed to capture Robert and present him to the junior de Orteville. Roger now had a choice to make. He realized that without Robert, his political ambitions were crippled and he loved his brother. 
In an almost comical fashion, the two siblings embraced one another in a teary-eyed reconciliation, naturally after Roger was promised his fair share of land and loot. A civil war had been prevented, and the conquest of Sicily could now continue. The situation in the Southern Isle had become decidedly more complex. Ibn Timna had been ambushed and slain while campaigning against Ibn Hawas in northern Sicily, thereby eliminating the Normans' only local ally. This did not deter the Ottavilles, and in the summer of 1062, Roger returned to Sicily while Robert remained in Apulia to put down Byzantine-supported rebellions in the region. The Norman expeditionary force arrived back in Troina to a surprisingly chilly reception. Initially, the Greek Christians hailed the Normans as liberators, but they soon realized that the Normans were harsh overlords who took what they wanted with little regard for the law. Roger did not pick up on the tension in the city, and departed with the bulk of his army to besiege the city of Nicosia, leaving Judith behind. The local population immediately rose up in revolt, forming a riotous mob and attempting to kidnap Judith, hoping that having her as a hostage would provide them the leverage needed to force Roger to withdraw from their city. The small Norman garrison left in Troina rallied to the defense of their lady, and a fierce melee ensued across the narrow streets. From there, the situation snowballed. Roger managed to gallop back to the city in time to join the garrison, but to his dismay, he found that thousands of Muslims from the surrounding countryside had taken up arms and flooded into Troina to aid the Christian Greeks. Overwhelmed, Roger was forced to order a general retreat into Troina's citadel, where the Normans holed up and prepared to weather a siege. For four months they held out within the citadel, suffering through a brutally icy winter. Once again, the Normans' salvation came through sheer luck. The Saracen soldiers guarding the perimeter had taken to drinking red wine to keep themselves warm in the frigid snows. Normally forbidden from drinking alcohol by the laws of their faith, they soon proved to be quite susceptible to its intoxicating effects. Roger soon realized he could take advantage of this drunkenness, and on a chilling January night, led a foray beyond his makeshift barricades and into the open streets. One by one, they subdued the Muslim outposts, all manned by inebriated, snoozing guards. Their position now secure, they engaged the Greek and Saracen besiegers in a general melee and retook the city. By now, the Muslim rulers of Sicily had come to realize what the Byzantines and Lombards had before them. The Normans were no mere mercenaries. They were a threat to the very existence of Islamic rule on their island. Quickly, the Saracen princes set aside their differences and put up a united front against the Norman encroachment. They looked across the Mediterranean for reinforcements, and received them from the Zirid Sultan Temim, who sent a sizable army of North African Berbers to Sicily, led by his princely sons, to crush the invasion. Roger was forced to return to Calabria to retrieve more horses for his knights, having eaten most of the ones they had during the siege. In the meantime, his wife Judith proved a capable martial commander, heading the defense of Troina while bands of Normans headed out to pillage the countryside for supplies. By the time Roger returned to Sicily, a massive Muslim army had gathered at Palermo and was heading eastwards towards his position. It was a dire situation. Roger had only around 130 knights and 500 infantrymen at his disposal. He could not count for help from his older brother either, as Robert's forces were tied down fighting the Byzantines in Apulia. The Benedictine monk Malaterra claims that the Saracen army numbered up to 50,000. While this is almost certainly hyperbole, it is safe to assume the Muslims numbered at least several thousand. Unwilling to sustain another drawn-out siege, Roger dispatched his cousin Celo with a contingent of 30 knights to secure Cherami, a town eight miles west of Troina. 
in June of 1063, the two forces clashed. The Muslim vanguard was the first to come upon Serlo's 30 knights, who had barred themselves within the walls of Chirami. The Muslims flung themselves upon the town walls, but were unable to dislodge their Norman foes. Three days later, Roger finally arrived to relieve Serlo's desperate situation, just in time to come head to head with the bulk of the Saracen army. The vanguard regrouped and joined the main Muslim ranks. The Norman count led a cavalry charge into his enemy, but was repulsed. Following that, he had barely enough time to form a defensive line before the sheer weight of the Muslim army crashed down upon his meager force. Despite being massively outnumbered, and against all odds, the Norman line held, with their heavy armour and knightly discipline being once more the deciding factor in battle. Serlo, meanwhile, had sallied out of Chirami, slammed into the Muslim left flank with his cavalry, and began to carve a bloody path through an ocean of lightly armoured Saracens towards his Norman comrades. As day turned to evening, Muslim morale collapsed, and they fled the field. Malaterra claims that the Normans slew over 20,000 men at Chirami, but this is once again likely an exaggeration. Nevertheless, they had won yet another highly unlikely victory. Much like how the Battle of Civitate had cemented their presence in the southern Italian mainland, the Battle of Cerami established the permanence of the Normans in Sicily. While the Normans had secured their control over the northeastern part of the island, their conquest of all Sicily was slowed exponentially in the years that followed. In 1064, both Roger and Robert mustered their levies and laid siege to Palermo, knowing that control over the immensely prosperous capital city was the only way to guarantee dominion over the whole island. During the siege, their camp was thoroughly infested by a species of venomous tarantula. Following this, the Normans made the completely and utterly reasonable decision to abandon the entire campaign. The years that followed saw Sicilian expansion delayed by wars fought on other fronts. Robert returned to Apulia to once more put down the perpetual rebellions in his domain. Without the aid of his brother's army, Roger was able to hold his Sicilian territory, but was prevented from making any significant land gains into the regions still dominated by Muslim emirs. After a few years of lull, the gears of war once more began to turn. In 1068, Roger won a decisive victory over the Muslims in an engagement outside the town of Missalmeri, which forced the Muslims of Sicily to begin turning on themselves. The Calbids of Palermo, led by Ibn Hawas, resolved that it was the interference of the North African Zirids that had led to their demise, and led an uprising against their rule. As riots broke out in Palermo, Ibn Hawas was killed, and the Zirid princes, deciding they had lost enough in Sicily, packed up and returned to North Africa. Muslim Sicily was now leaderless, and deprived of the bulk of its army. Its capital lay helpless to invasion. In the year 1071, Robert Giscard capped off a long and grueling campaign in Apulia, when he finally conquered Bari, ending the Byzantine presence in Italy once and for all. With the southern mainland firmly in Norman hands, the full might of the Franco-Norsemen could be finally rendered upon Palermo, the jewel of the Mediterranean. Indeed, the city soon fell to the combined might of the Orteville brothers, and by 1072 was fully in Norman hands. The Islamic rump state in Sicily was given a reprieve, as the Orteviles turned their conquering armies towards Naples, Amalfi, Salerno and Abruzzo. But by now, their fate was inevitable. Roger had been made the first Count of Sicily, the vassal of his brother, the Duke of Apulia. In 1085, he conquered Syracuse, the last great Muslim city in Sicily. In 1091, Notto, the final Islamic outpost, fell to the relentless de Orteville, ending nearly two centuries of Muslim rule on the island. For the next hundred years, the borders of the Norman realm would go largely unchanged. 
while the region had new masters, its people remained diverse. The Normans, alongside their Orthodox Greek and Muslim Arab subjects, created perhaps the most culturally dynamic kingdom in the history of medieval Europe. The sponsor of this video, Call of War, allows you to take command of your nation's army during the darkest hours of human history, the Second World War. In this free online strategy game, you get to fight up to 100 other players in real time and rewrite the history of World War II. Support our channel by downloading Call of War via the link in the description and receive a free starter pack with one month of high command and 13,000 gold with a value of $10. The offer is available for 30 days from the release of this video. In the next episode, we will explore just what made Norman Italy so unique. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.